Welcome to part three of my huge 2020 Ubiquiti Unify home network upgrade. It is now time to finally mount the Unify Nano HD access point in place of my Apple Airport Extreme. So the Airport Extreme has been unplugged from the power since I installed the Unify gear into the rack because we've been running off that single AP upstairs and it's been absolutely great but it would be really nice to get the Nano HD into its proper finalized location to know how well it's gonna perform. This airport mount is quite simple. I can just remove the Airport Extreme. Thank you, Airport Extreme, for, I think, four years of faithful service. Now, one great thing about the Nano HD, we won't have to worry about this guy anymore. We can disconnect that from the other side, then pull it through. We only have to worry about this guy, but first, we've gotta worry about mounting the bracket because this bracket is so huge. I'm really hoping that we can cover all of these screw holes that I previously made when installing this bracket. Okay, and there is the removal of the bracket. And looks like I did a little bit of a drilling blunder on one of these screw holes last time. That plug is a little bit loose. Looks like I used a bit that was slightly too large. Maybe I didn't have the other bit at the time. Let's kill the power to this guy so that we can pull it through. So I have a little UPS here in the cupboard and this socket here is powering the airport. So it's traveling down here cable tied and it's cable tied here and then it's going through the wall to power the airport. So we can ditch this entire cable run. I'm going to need to snip these cable ties and just ditch this all together because PoE is obviously going to provide us redundant power from the rack upstairs, so the AP will no longer be running off this secondary UPS. So the power cable should now be free and pull out independently of the network cable. I'll do this slowly because I don't want too much of the wall to collapse. There we have it. So that's another portion of my network really simplified with the elimination of yet another external power supply. So the next question is, can I mount this access point in such a way that I cover these dreadful holes? Let's have a look. So the mount is absolutely tiny, as you guys can see, and I believe that the cable is gonna to need to come out. Let's have a look. Ah, the cable's gonna to need to be at the bottom. We should just about Cover them, maybe. So we've got the mount up on the wall. Little bit ugly at the bottom here, but we'll sort that out. The room needs redecoration anyway. It's not exactly flat. The wall is a bit bulgy and kind of horrible, but once the AP is on there, it should be pretty good. Let's test this line. I do need to redo this connector at some point because this is a bit ugly, but you're not gonna see it anyway. And if it's functional, it'll do for now. So let's give that a test and see how we go. I'm 99% sure that it's port 20 for that access point. So let's plug in the tester and just go for it. The other end is plugged in downstairs. And this port was working with my Airport Extreme, obviously, but before sending PoE, before plugging it into its destination in the switch here, I just need to make sure that it's 100% working on all the pairs. Perfect. We can now plug in the access point to port number one on our switch and we are ready to connect the Nano HD. So let's plug her in and see what she does. Do we have a light? Yes, it's lit up. Boom, there it is guys. Our new wireless access point. And if it wasn't for these two holes underneath, that would look pretty clean. But I've got some filler, I can fill those. It won't be the same color for now, but it'll look better than two gaping holes. And then when we repaint the room, it'll look great. So check that out. So the access point has now booted up, it's blue. And just to show you an AB comparison, this is what we've come from. So <laughs> it's a little more sleek, a lot smaller, and my God, it's much, much better. Nice. So I've got some speed test results of the old versus the new system. So the old system was the Airport Extreme that we just removed. That was mounted in the prime location downstairs for sort of the main access point. And then upstairs, filling in all the upstairs areas, I had the Apple Time Capsule sitting in my office on top of the rack 
With the new setup, the Unify stuff, we've only got a single AP. It's the Nano HD mounted in the same place that the Airport Extreme was mounted, nothing upstairs. So I've got the results, let's take a look. So it's nothing incredibly scientific, folks, just a couple of speed tests on my phone in different locations of my home. But let's take a little look at the pretty solid performance of the Airport kit. Now, I didn't make the Unify switch to get better Wi-Fi performance. As I spoke about in part one, I made the switch to Unify for the management and the flexibility and the security. So we don't really heavily rely on the Wi-Fi, but it's still nice to have really good coverage. So taking a look at the airport results, we've got the exact same result for the living room and the kitchen. These are the only two rooms that we have downstairs. I've got an open plan living space and a kitchen, and then the only places I haven't tested in my home are the bathrooms. I've got a bathroom upstairs and downstairs. They're not on the list. So the living room and the kitchen both got equally good test results. The weakest test result on the list is the third one down. That is the back bedroom, and that's because that bedroom is built in an extension. So even though it's kind of very close to an access point, or it was when the time capsule was upstairs, there's a big exterior wall blocking the signal. So that's why you see it at about six megs slower there, but it was still perfectly adequate in that room. Moving on down to IMNCHQ, obviously really fast because you're in the same room as an airport. And then coming down, we've got the two front bedrooms pretty much within the margin of error. So a very even score across my home there. So let's bring in the Unify results with the single Nano HD access point for comparison. So looking at the living room and the kitchen, you can see that we consistently get those good speeds from the living room and kitchen, which is nice. What surprised me was we get really good results in the back bedroom now. So even though there's no upstairs access point, it seems to be in just the right place to get good signal from the downstairs access point through that exterior wall. So very happy about that result for the back bedroom. Then we've got IMNCHQ, which is pretty much directly above the Nano HD, even though it's on different floors, it's directly above it. So good result there. And then we've got the front two bedrooms, which did shock me. Now, the speed is significantly lower in the front two bedrooms, and that just comes down probably to the structure of my home. One of these front bedrooms is pretty much behind the Nano HD. So you're to the side of it and you're up and you're behind. So you see quite a drop there in speed. And I did run those tests a couple of times just to make sure the front two bedrooms definitely do get the rough end of the stick there. But as I say, considering the way that it's mounted and considering that it's a single AP, that is still very good coverage for my home. Now, if I wanted to increase the speed in those front two bedrooms at any point, I could easily pop another small access point upstairs and it would fill in all of those areas and it would be blazing in every single room. So I am over the moon with that speed result. I was very curious to see how a single Nano HD would handle my home. It's important to remember that my house is really old. So unlike a modern build or even a slightly newer home where most of the walls would be stud walls and you wouldn't have half as much stone and brick to penetrate, that signal would be perfect absolutely everywhere. But my walls are crazy thick and there's just layers and layers of different materials that go into this house. It's completely solid. So I am chuffed to bits with that performance. And those two front bedrooms where you see the weaker signal, one of them is our bedroom, the master bedroom, and we don't have a TV or a computer or any kind of devices in that room whatsoever. We basically just have our phones and that speed is still perfectly fine for the odd little bit of phone browsing before bed or whatever we tend to do. Very little Wi-Fi usage in that room. And then the other room is Eli's bedroom. And he's a little four-year-old. He doesn't have a phone, he doesn't have a TV, he doesn't have a tablet, he doesn't use Wi-Fi. So as it stands at the moment, I won't be making any changes to the Wi-Fi in my home. Everywhere that I need good Wi-Fi performance, it's absolutely solid. So maybe in the future, when the kids get older and they put more demand on my network, I could easily pop a little access point over there upstairs to fill in those little areas where the signal from that main access point isn't quite reaching. And as a closing note to this clip, I've not tweaked the access point in any way. It's sitting there at default settings. I haven't fiddled whatsoever in the Unify controller. I just popped it up, plugged it in, and did the speed test results. So that is exactly how it stands at default. So it is finally time to check out some more advanced configuration of my network. First things first, I want to say thank you to absolutely everyone who suggested different things. One of those things was two-factor authentication. It was great to have a reminder to use two-factor authentication. So I've set that up and I did that within my Unify account itself. And that was really easy. It works with the Google Authenticator app. 
great stuff, much more secure. So thank you to Factor Authentication. The second thing I want to touch on before we delve into the network config itself, a couple of people told me that backups weren't enabled by default. So I have enabled backups of the controller, the configuration. So that means anytime I need to restore from a backup, I'll be able to do so. So controller settings, backup, and you guys can see that I have auto backup enabled and I've chosen a time and a day and a frequency that it does the auto backup. This, I believe, stores to the local storage, the local flash storage in the UDM Pro, as far as I know, because it doesn't ask where you want to dump the backup file. So I presume it's just sitting there within the UDM itself. And if you ever wanted to restore from a backup, you would restore in this section here. So I've got my backups enabled. I now feel a lot safer. So my original plan for this segment of the video was to do it in a very similar style to the screen recorded portion of part two, where I screen record my process of learning and going through it for the first time. And Unfortunately, that wasn't really possible with this advanced configuration stage. Because I'm so new to this, this is my first time setting up a Unify network, and I really needed to knuckle down and learn this stuff and get it right, and I had to do a lot of forum searching, a lot of Googling. It wasn't really feasible to record the screen. I did start, but I ended up with over two hours of screen recorded footage, and I'd only scratched the surface of setting up my network. It took me about two days overall to get all this working the way I wanted to get it working. So what I've decided to do, it'll be much more entertaining and a it'll make a lot more sense for you guys. I've completely set up the network now and what we're going to do, I'm going to give you a tour around all of the settings and show you the step-by-step -step processes I did to get this up and running and working in the way that I wanted. So before I even touched the controller, I needed to make a plan. So I took to a little document and I decided to write down absolutely everything that I needed in order to build this network in the way that I wanted to build it. So the most important part of this doc and the part that I referenced the most was this section up here, the network section. And this is is my basic plan of how we are separating the network. Now here at the top we've got this section LAN. This is the default network that comes out of the box with the UDM Pro. So at the end of part two when we set up the network and it was up and running and all of my devices were running on the network they were all running on the LAN which was the 192.168.1. whatever address. So the gateway itself resides at 192.168.1.1. That's still the case for me because I use all of my network network devices on this LAN. I've kept the LAN as it is, haven't altered it apart from the DHCP range that I showed previously. And this will sit here as it is and just host my network devices. So that's what I'm using LAN for. My first VLAN here is VLAN 10, which you can see is labeled main. This is my default network, if you like, the network that myself and Jess will be using all of the time. This is where all of the main computers will sit, desktops and laptops. This is where our phones will connect to, and this is where my servers sit. So any machine that we trust and we know and that's ours and all of our pretty much everything that we use will sit on the main network. The second VLAN is our IoT VLAN, Internet of Things. This is a very common VLAN to make with a managed network like this. The basic idea is in this kind of age that we're in now with loads of growing smart devices, so many different bits and bobs chatting away on the network. You've got your Amazon Echo stuff, doorbells, thermostats, light bulbs. Pretty much everything these days is smart. So the more devices you get on your network and the more brands of different devices that you get sat on your network, they're all chit-chatting away there. And if they can all see your main servers and your main machines, if there's ever a compromise with one or more of those devices and they tunnel their way through into your other machines, they could potentially find some of your data and you just don't want these really chatty devices sitting on the same network as your important stuff. So by making a separate VLAN, we can put rules in place to stop these devices from seeing all of these machines. Therefore, they are much more protected and out of the way behind a firewall. And these guys can't see these guys. So that's the purpose of an IoT VLAN. My third VLAN is called Workbench. And this is for my own particular use case scenario. It's not gonna be applicable to everyone or even useful to everyone. But this for me is similar to an IoT network, but a little different with the IoT network because there needs to be quite a bit of chatting between this network and the main network at least controlled chatting because you may want to use your mobile phones to control certain devices on the IoT network, etc. So there's certain 
steps that we've got to take there. But this network is just like the IoT network for me, but completely isolated. So on its own, 100%. If you plug into this network, you only get an internet connection and you cannot see anything else, no exceptions. And my use for this VLAN is simply for machines that I get in for repair. If someone drops off a laptop and they want me to repair it and I need to connect it to the network to download something or whatever the case may be, I don't know what state that machine is in. I don't know what files they've got on it. I don't know what malicious things are lurking around. So if I plug it into my network, I don't want all of my servers and my main machines to be at risk of attacks from things that are possibly stored on these machines. So by plugging them into this VLAN, I get a simple tunnel through to the internet and that's all I need. My fourth VLAN is for cameras. And then our fifth VLAN is our guest VLAN. And this is pretty much just to get guest Wi-Fi up and running. So in terms of the subnet, I've matched the VLAN ID to the third octet in the IP address here. So that means that VLAN 10, 20, 30, they don't even have to be in 10s. They can be whatever they want. You know, they can be 18, they can be 102, they can be whatever. I've just done it going up in tens because it's really easy to remember, starting at 10 and working my way up in order of what I consider as importance. So order, <laughs> order of importance, if that even makes sense. And then I've just matched all of the IP addresses to those VLAN IDs. That way I know that if I want to access something on a particular VLAN, I always know that the third octet is the same as the VLAN ID. We've also planned out our wireless access. So this again is really simple. So I'm going to have three total SSIDs, Starbug, Starbug IoT and Starbug Guest. More sci-fi references there folks for those of you who are into your sci-fi. So Firstly, you can see this is network number 10 or VLAN 10. Starbug is my main VLAN. So this main SSID will be connected to my main network. The second one is Starbug IoT, VLAN 20. The reason we want a VLAN 20 IoT SSID is so that we can connect our Amazon Echo and Harmony Hub and the growing number of smart devices around the home that connect via Wi-Fi. And third, we've got Starbug Guest, VLAN 50. And you can see a quick note here, throttled, 5, 1. 5 download, 1 upload, 5 megabit per second. So this just throttles the guest network. I did it for fun and, and just to learn how to throttle it really within the controller. Um, it just means that if your guests come over, if you do have a lot of guests and they use your Wi-Fi, when they come over, if you're downloading a big file or uploading a big file or you're you're doing something fairly heavy on the network, you know that if they start browsing and trying to upload and download things, you know that they're not going to take all of your bandwidth. So that's a good little thing to learn how to do. And they are the three SSIDs. You'll notice that I don't have an SSID that ties to workbench or cameras. That's because my cameras will always be wired, so they don't need a wireless network. And my workbench devices will always be wired. I'm only making this VLAN for a couple of ports on the workbench, so I don't need wireless access for those devices. So other than that in my doc, here the rest is really self-explanatory and basically just for my own referencing this is my main switch this is basically what port on the switch does what and down here you can also see the ports on the UDM now a quick note in the last video I didn't realize that the UDM has a limited bandwidth total on the eight port switch of one gigabit per second so the switch itself the dedicated switch is much 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 faster than using the UDM Pro so I'm going to fill up my main switch first and then the the UDM Pro will be the overflow port. I think it's 30 something gigabits per second the switch itself is capable of. So much more throughput there on the switch. It makes much more sense to put the servers and stuff there. So you can just see color coded and the LAN itself, uh, sorry, the network column itself shows you which network is gonna be what on the switch end. And then similarly down here, we've got the table for the TV switch. This is really easy. All of the devices connected to the TV will be on VLAN 20, the IoT network but we've got a little difference with the Apple TV here. Now, I was talking earlier about the communication that needs to take place between a main network and an IoT network. Because our mobile phones and computers and servers are all sitting in this main network, if there is a device on the IoT network that has heavy reliance on those things, they're gonna to need to communicate a lot. So we're putting a firewall rule in place in between these two networks to completely stop the IoT network from being able to see the main network. But that actually hinders us with devices such as the Apple TV. Now, you can open up ports so you can poke little holes through the firewall and just allow the certain traffic through that the Apple TV needs to do certain things. However, I've decided at this stage at least to take a different approach. 
what I've decided to do is give the Apple TV a static IP and I've decided to allow the Apple TV, even though it's on VLAN 20, I've decided to allow it unrestricted access to my main network. So this means that yes, it's sitting on that VLAN, but I can now access main from the Apple TV. I can't access LAN because the firewall rule will still be in place to stop that from happening. I've specifically allowed a rule to allow the Apple TV to access main. And the reason I've decided to do that is because the amount of services that I use on the Apple TV is extensive and it would be a lot of trial and error to try and get that communication happening through the firewall without granting it total access, which is what we've done. So just as an idea and off the top of my head, firstly, I run a Plex server to the Apple TV. I also run iTunes streaming. I run photo streaming for a screensaver. I use the iTunes remote app. I also use the Apple TV remote itself. I use AirPlay and all of these different things need to communicate between those networks. It would be a pain for me to get it up and running. There's probably even more that the Apple TV does, but trusting one device is not the end of the world. And I do have time in the future if I want to try and get all of these ports op opened up and do it the more sort of proper way, if you like. But the Xbox, the Wii U, the Switch, they'll all be completely isolated. So essentially I'm just trusting the Apple TV. So that was the extent of my planning phase and Let's take a look at all of that and how it translates into the controller. So, first of all, we're going to make our VLANs. And this, out of everything, is the easiest thing. And I was two shakes doing this. Great stuff in Unify here. So, networks, local networks. And you can see that this list corresponds to my list that I have here. So, LAN comes as default, like we said. And then I simply made all of my additional networks. So, let's go and take a look at one of my networks. If we go into Edit... I gave it a name, main. I gave it its network ID, which is 10. I then gave it the subnet with that network ID in the third octet because it's easier, like I said. And then I gave it a DHCP range. This one has quite a high up start address of 30 because I've got a lot of stuff that will sit on the main network that will have a static IP, these servers and things like that. So again, gives me a nice lot of room down there. I turn on IGMP snooping. So that's an example of a main network and all of these other VLANs are the same apart from guest. If we take a look at guest, instead of a corporate network, this is a guest network, specifically a guest network. And everything else is pretty much the same, giving it the ID 50, giving it its default range here, which is great because as soon as you put in a subnet, you can just press auto configure and it populates all of that. And everything else here is fine. And if we just click on the create new network button, advanced, you'll see that you get the exact same window. I put in the name, you can select either corporate or guest, VLAN, whatever, and you put everything in really nice and straightforward. I was two shakes getting up and running with a list of my networks. So five VLANs and the default LAN all sitting there ready to go. The next thing that I wanted to do in preparation for the guest Wi-Fi was make that profile to throttle the bandwidth. So to do that, I came down configuration profiles, client groups and you can see in here I have a guest 5 megabit per second and 2 megabit per second create client group here this is how easy it is you give it a name and you throttle right here and you're able to define whatever speed you want in either kilobits per second or megabits per second maybe five and one is a little stingy folks i don't know but it's there in place and it's working anyways once i had the vlan set up and i had a profile in here ready to throttle the guest network it was a case of making the wi-fi ssids to accompany those networks so this is where we look at this little table here vlan 10 vlan 20 and vlan 50. so i made all three networks from scratch starbug starbug iot and guest so if we just jump into one of these networks, we can see Starbug. And the only things I had to do was name it, give it a password, and then the specific portion that we needed to use to allow it to access just main network was here, use a VLAN, toggle it, enter the VLAN number, so VLAN 10, which corresponds to our main network, and that was that SSID made. I did the same for the IoT network, but of course, that corresponds to VLAN 20, so I just put 20 in that box instead, also gave it a different name and a different password. And then the guest network is ever so slightly different. If we have a look at this one, you can see that down here, I've enabled the guest policies, and I've also given it VLAN 50, and it's using the client group. So this client group is the guest one, and that corresponds to what we just created in the profile section down here, which was that 5-1 throttling. So by selecting that, 
it throttles that entire SSID. So because we've applied that on the wireless network level, if you then dedicate a switch port, for example, to the guest network and plug in, that switch port will be at full speed. It won't limit the overall guest VLAN. We're just limiting the speed of the guest SSID. But that's fine because your guest is never going to be coming and plugging in via Ethernet. <laughs> Maybe my nerdy guests may turn up and they want an Ethernet connection. Who knows? But if that's the case, then they're welcome to have full speed because they deserve that because I'd probably respect them quite a bit for asking for a network port in the first place. So the SSID is, itself is the only thing that's actually throttled to the 5.1 bandwidth cap. After creating the Wi-Fi networks, I went to enable MDNS, which can be found here under Gateway. It's just a single toggle. So next I want to touch on the switch ports and Basically up to this point, we've got our VLANs and we've got our SSIDs that correspond to the VLANs. So if we give a little bit of attention to the wired devices now, down into configuration profiles once again, but this time into switch ports. And I didn't create these guys. These are here by default. So if you create a VLAN, they'll automatically populate these sections here, which will create switch port profiles for you to only have a specific switch port offering a certain VLAN. I didn't have to change anything in here because in my use case, I only need switch ports to correspond to a single VLAN. But if you would like to access two VLANs or three VLANs, multiple, any kind of combination of your different networks from a single switch port, to whatever device is plugged into it, you can create your own switch port profiles and assign as many VLANs as you want to that port, I believe. So it's cool that they kind of save you that step. They automatically make the VLAN switch port profiles for you. And that's all that I needed. It's all I need at the moment anyway. So that's perfect. The next stage to getting this functional was to give every device that needed a static IP a static IP. So if we take a look at all of our clients, we have certain devices here in the list that currently have a static IP. This is some kind of bug. I believe, in Unify. This Apple TV currently, ah, you see, it just changed there. I've been facing this the whole time. When I've had devices with static IPs, they seem to fluctuate between the old DHCP address that they had and the new static IP that I've set. So let's take the Apple TV as an example here, folks. Let's try and ping that Apple TV at 192.168.20.220, which is the address that it's telling me the Apple TV is sitting on there. I'm not getting a response. But if I try and ping it on the address that I know that it actually resides on, so ping 192.168.20.11, which is the static IP that I've given the Apple TV, I get requests from it just fine and it works perfectly well. Even though on the client list here, it's not displaying the correct IP address. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Regardless of this little, presumably a little bug, I have certain devices here that are sat with static IPs. So the Apple TV has this address. And then another good example is Scaro has this address. I haven't created the link aggregation yet. We'll look at that a bit later on. But Scaro resides at this address. Venus is another example of this little bug. It's not actually residing at this address. It's residing at, um, let's have a look, ping 192.168.10.11. This is Venus, is it? No, 1.12, sorry, 10.12. That's where Venus is residing. See, this is the beauty of having a list like this. It tells me that Venus is residing at 10.12 and I'm getting response from that. So yeah, I'm not sure what's happening here with the list. It's a bit unfortunate and it tripped me up a little bit, but I'm now kind of watching out for it as I go. So I know that these addresses may not correspond. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is before we create our firewall rules, anything that you want to give a static IP address to, it's good to do it beforehand because if you want to put firewall rules in place that address certain IP addresses, those addresses are gonna to need to be correct before you do so. After we've got all our IP addresses sorted and stuff like that, we can assign certain ports on the switch to be certain networks and this is really easy. So let's use our TV switch as an example, the living room switch. You can see that every port two, three, four and five need to be on IoT 20, VLAN 20, sorry, which is the IoT network. If we go into ports, these are the ports on the switch. If we look at this port first, this profile is currently set to all because that switch port is communicating with the rest of the network, so that's fine. But the individual ports themselves that go to the devices, so the Apple TV, for instance, is sat there on the IoT network. And these profiles correspond to where we were a minute ago down here in the profiles in the settings section, where the controller had automatically generated those switch port profiles for us after we created the VLANs. So again, another port on the switch, 
all IoT. If we go onto my main switch, we've done the same thing with the main switch. You can see different ports that are in use here. A good example is port number three here, which our Philips Hue bridge resides on. The Philips Hue bridge needs to be on the IoT network, so on the port itself, it's an IoT port. But if we look at, say, port number nine, which is where Scaro is sat, that is a main network port. And then we look at port number eight is a camera's VLAN one, which is VLAN number 40, which corresponds to what we planned earlier. So you get the idea of the ports and how they correspond to the different VLANs. Obviously, the only thing to remember is when making static IPs, like when we made the static IP for the Apple TV, obviously, because it's going to be on the IoT VLAN, that static IP has to be 192.168.20. something. And that dot something has to be outside or before the start address of the DHCP range, or after, depending on where you finish the range, but it just makes more sense to put it beforehand. So like the Apple TV is on 192.168.20.11. So up to this point, everything has been fine, but none of it has a real function or purpose outside of a little bit of additional organization because there are no rules in place Place to stop these VLANs from speaking to each other. So let's delve into what definitely took me the most time to learn and that is the firewall and I haven't even nailed it yet. So I'm going to do my best to explain to you guys how I've set this up and hopefully it'll make some sense to you. So firewall. Firstly, we're going to look at groups. So if we scroll down past the firewall here, I've made certain groups and the name of these groups, we've got workbench only, cameras only, IoT only, and guest only. These correspond to all of the VLANs that I want some separation involved in some way. So the group name, think of it like the opposite to the name. So I've done this for my own convenience. It's probably not the most conventional way to do it, but let's take the IoT network, for instance. If we have a look at the group that I've created, in the list here of addresses, I have every single network that isn't the IoT network. So what this allows us to do when we make a firewall rule, we can make one rule to stop the IoT network from chatting to all of these networks in the same rule. We do that by using the group. So everything is in here apart from VLAN 20, which is obviously the one that we're making the rule for in the first place. So as another example, let's have a look at the workbench and all of them apart from VLAN 30 are in this list. So it'll stop the workbench chatting to any of these when we make the rule. It's just really clean and it saves us making five or six individual rules for the separate VLANs, which would be really time consuming and kind of a little bit heavy on the firewall, I guess. So with the groups in place, I then made the main rules that would stop everything chatting and intermingling. So we're gonna click on LAN up here and I, I made all of my rules on the LAN section. So all of the ones in kind of gray are the ones that are default. So I didn't touch these. I didn't even worry about them. They're all whatever. I just made my own little rules up here. So we've got one rule. We're gonna ignore this one for a second. We've got one rule for every VLAN that I wanted to drop traffic apart from the guest. We'll talk about the guest in, the, in a minute. So let's take a look at first of all, say my workbench for instance, and how I built up this rule. So we made the rule on the LAN in which is the front portion of the router before it routes anything. It's gonna look at this firewall rule and if it doesn't need to route that traffic, then it won't waste any resources doing so. So that's where I've popped all of these drop rules. LAN in, giving it a name, um, probably doesn't make a great deal of sense, but I know what it means. Block workbench to all. So workbench network can't see any other network essentially. Before predefined rules, the action is dropping because we're dropping all the traffic here. That's giving us our sort of um, privacy, if you like, on that network. And then this is the, the kind of key section here. The source is the network itself. So the workbench network, we want to drop all the traffic. And here is the group that we made. So between all of those other networks, the IoT network, everything that resided in that group that we just looked at, we've selected the group as the destination. So the workbench network cannot see anything from any other VLAN. And then we press save. We did the same thing for the cameras. And then for IoT, we did the same thing, 
But when I first made it, I wasn't able to access the IoT network in the way that I wanted to. So I don't want the de IoT devices to be able to see any of the other VLANs, but when my phone is sitting on the main VLAN, I wanted to be able to control devices on the IoT network, and it wasn't working, and this was frustrating. So for instance, my phone is on main. It's on, my phone is sitting here, Starbug. So it's on VLAN 10 on the wireless network. And then my Philips Hue bridge is sitting on VLAN 20 on a wired network. And I wanted to control my Philips Hue bridge using my phone that was sitting on the Starbug SSID. In order to do that, while keeping the VLAN segregated, the IoT VLAN on its own, I of course used source as network IoT. So same as the workbench network, destination the IoT group, but under advanced, I just toggled this guy, match state new, and I just stumbled across this online. And what that allowed me to do was then communicate to the IoT devices from my main network. And that was great. So I'm not sure if that's entirely the right way to do it because I know you can create allow rules and accept certain traffic. I also tried that for just the main network to the IoT network, but I couldn't get it working in the direction that I wanted to with this rule in place. So I have the functionality that I want and we'll try and demo it in a minute. And then all I have additionally up here is this rule. Now, this is where this section comes in, the Apple TV. The Apple TV is sitting on the IoT network, but I want it to talk to main network. So this was really easy to set up. I wanted to be able to see all those servers and everything like that, like we spoke about. So LAN in again. This time, accept all the traffic. It's an accept rule. And we're accepting, obviously, from the static IP of the Apple TV that we set. And this is why it was good to make a static IP, because it allowed us to make this rule really easily. And then under the destination, I wanted it to talk to my main network. So network network main. We didn't use a group, obviously, because we, it was just one device to one network. So that is the allow rule. Another quick set of rules that I made that was slightly different. After I did all this, it was great. My workbench network couldn't see my servers, couldn't see my main machines. My I IoT network couldn't see my main machines. It was all perfect. But all of these networks could still see the gateway. They could all ping 192.168.1.1. So essentially, you could access the unified controller from all of these networks. So to solve that, I made three more rules, one for IoT, one for Workbench, and one for cameras. If we have a look at these rules, in order to stop them hitting the gateway, I made a LAN local rule, and then drop, and under source, I selected network IoT, and this would be the same Workbench or cameras, and then under destination, I selected network LAN, and that means that these VLANs can no longer hit the gateway. That's what this rule allows you to do. Absolutely perfect. Now I'm currently on, if you look over here, I am on 192.168.10. something. So I am sitting on Starbug. No, I'm not. I'm not on a wireless network. I'm on a wired network. So I'm sitting on a wired VLAN 10, which is my main network. Now we don't have any firewall rules in here that restricts the main network. So I can chat really happily to LAN from VLAN 10. So I can ping firstly the gateway. That's the UDM itself, and I get responses from the UDM. And this demo will make sense in a minute, because I'll, I'll log into a different network and I'll show you the restrictions actually working. I can also ping, say, my switch, which is 192.168.1.2, and I'll get responses from my main switch. I'll get responses from all of the gear that's sitting on LAN. So quickly, if we go into the guest section, I also made some rules for the guest network. Firstly, we were just chatting about the gateway one. I made the same thing. The guest network by default could access the gateway. So let's take a look at this one. Instead of LAN local, it's now guest local. Same thing, drop from source. That is gonna be our guest network. And our destination is gonna be LAN because then our guest network can't hit the gateway. And also, once I've made the guest network, I couldn't see any machines as such, but I was still able, I did a little test. I went onto the guest Wi-Fi and I was still able to control my Philips Hue light bulbs, which I didn't want. So I decided in the guest section to create the same kind of rule. So block guests to all. I did it this time because it's a guest network in the guest in section of the router. And it was similar to those other firewall rules that I made. So drop all the traffic. Under source, we use the guest network. And under destination, wanted to drop to all of the other networks, so I created a group for that. And since I've done that, the guest network is able to browse the internet, obviously, but it's not able to hit any 
of my devices or control any of my smart stuff. And that is it for firewall rules, guys. So if we go to all these white ones are all of the ones that I've made that allow me to get the separation that I want between my VLANs. So without further ado, let's demo this actually working. So I said that I was on VLAN 10, which is main VLAN, and that is this guy. So from main, we want to be able to access everything. I've already demonstrated pinging LAN devices, so I can ping my gateway, I can ping my switch, but let's ping something on the IoT network. So ping. We're pinging the static IP address of the Apple TV and we're getting responses even though we're not on that network. So that is that uh, exception on the firewall rule I was talking about earlier with the IoT network because we want to be able to control the IoT devices with our phones and stuff that are on the different VLAN obviously. So you can see that that is working just fine. Now what I'm going to do to continue the demo, I'm actually going to unplug my Ethernet right here right now. So I'm going to yank that out my machine and we're going to connect to Wi-Fi and we're going to connect to the IoT network. And I'm gonna show you guys the functionality of the IoT network. So let's go down to Starbug IoT. And we're gonna to need to put in our password. And we'll just wait for that to connect to Starbug IoT. There we have it, Starbug IoT. And just to double check and confirm everything, you can see our new IP address is Dot 20. So we're in that 20 subnet and you can see the router displays as 192.168.20.1. So we're now in IoT. Now. Obviously, we're now on the same network as the Apple TV, so we can ping 192.168.20.11 and we'll get responses from the Apple TV naturally. We're on the same VLAN. But if you guys remember earlier when we were on main and we could communicate with the Apple TV, it doesn't work the other way around. So let's try and communicate with something on the main network. Ping 192.168.10.10. So 10 is the subnet of our main network. 10 is the VLAN, sorry, of our main network. And dot 10 is the static IP address for Scaro, my server. Check this out. The IoT network cannot see Scaro. Let's try something else. Let's try and ping something on LAN. So let's ping the switch. Ping 192.168.1.2. That's a static IP of the switch. It can't see the switch. But the beauty of this, and this is all corresponding to the single rule that we made here, the block IoT to all. Let's see the performance of blocking the IoT devices to the gateway. This rule here, let's see this one operating. Ping 192.168.1.1 and we get no response. So we're on the IoT network right now. And yes, I'm still in the controller here. If I try and click anywhere else, it won't work because if I refresh the page, then it wouldn't work. It's just allowing me to sit here. If I try and actually go to 192.168.1.1, it won't allow me to access the controller. It'll just hang here, and I won't be able to talk to my dream machine at all. This is the case for all of the networks that I've applied this rule to. So everything apart from main and LAN. So that is beautiful functionality. So what we'll do now is take a look at the guest network. So what we'll do for this is we'll go to speed test, and I'll demonstrate the functionality of a full bandwidth connection on speed test. So as you can see here on Wi-Fi, we're getting up into the sort of higher end speeds that we get on our connection, which is perfect. Let's now switch our Wi-Fi network to the guest network. We'll go down to guest and I'll put in my password for guest. So we've connected to the guest network and we should be now on VLAN 50. Let's double check that in system preferences. Our IP address is now in VLAN 50, as you can see there. This is a beautiful thing about setting the IP, the subnet, the same as your VLAN ID because it's much less confusing. So now let's check out the speed test once again and you guys will be able to see that throttling working. We'll start up a little connection here. Now again, this will only work over Wi-Fi, but you're not gonna really wanna dedicate switch ports to a guest network anyway. And you can see we have that limitation there working on the download and then a mega throttled horrible upload speed. So you can see the throttling working on the guest network. And now the guest network rules themselves. We can't ping anything obviously. So we did the gateway rule for the guest network that I'm not gonna be able to show you. Oh, actually it's on the same list here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Block guest to gateway. So let's try and ping the gateway. Our request time's out for the gateway. We can't access anything on LAN. So we can't access the switch. Let's try and access something on the main network. So we can't access Scaro. And let's try and access something on IoT. And 
and we can't access the Apple TV on IoT. So the guest network is completely on its own. And for this functionality, it's the same replicated pretty much for Workbench. So Workbench can't see any of these things that we just pinged in here either. So I can't demonstrate Workbench on the Wi-Fi because I don't have a Workbench SSID, but if I was to plug into a Workbench switch port down here, then my results would be similar or exactly the same, sorry, for pinging the gateway, anything on the LAN, anything on the IoT network or anything on any network for that matter, apart from the same network that you're currently on. So that, my friends, is the extent of my advanced configuration so far. I am chuffed to bits with the functionality of this. And again, the most crucial part and the part that I really didn't know how to get working beforehand was my devices on the main network being able to still talk to the IoT network, things like Logitech Harmony. So I use the Harmony app. It's communicating perfectly between these two VLANs for me, yet that Harmony hub cannot see any of the machines on my VLAN. So it's like the, it's like the best of both worlds. So. I'm chuffed a bit with how it's worked out and I hope this hasn't been too rushed or too confusing. I've done my best to explain everything I've done. Um, give me a feedback in the comment section. Would love to hear your thoughts on my sort of two days of learning process here with the firewall and how I've got things up and running. Now that the bulk of the network configuration is done, it's time to give some attention to the physical side. Now, one of the biggest questions I got on the previous part was why have you put your switch so far away from your patch panel? Well, hopefully the next couple of minutes of the video will answer that question. I've got a little box of tricks down here and one of those things, or two I should say, are some brushed panels so that we can take cables from the front of the rack, put them back in. And I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach this time. I'm gonna use longer patch cables, take them out into the back, back in and we're going to make it all neat and tidy. It should work really well. I've been thinking about this for a long time. This will be my third major sort of redesign of my patch system since I bought the rack and hopefully third time lucky.
Well, I am chuffed at the way that looks, and I'm even more chuffed with the entire network. It is awesome to play with this kit, and I'm learning new stuff every single time I log into my dream machine. I'm just learning, learning, finding more features, and just really growing my knowledge. This has been such a learning experience for me. It's been so exciting to put this stuff out for you guys and to share my journey. So I really hope you've enjoyed this three-part series. I want to say a massive thank you for all of your support. I can't get over how popular these videos have been. I'm so glad you guys are enjoying them. And another huge thank you to Ubiquity. Without their generosity, this would not have been possible. I would not have been able to do all of this in one big hit like this and make a big dramatic series so thank you so much guys for believing in me once again and even though we've come to an end of this series there was a lot that I couldn't fit into these three parts so I've got videos coming a little bit further down the pipeline if you're interested in more Unify stuff and you're new to the channel please consider subscribing because I do have more Unify videos planned a specific video that I have planned is a much deeper look at Unify Protect we weren't able to look very much at Unify Protect in this series, but we're gonna get onto that in the future, as well as a couple of other little things. I'm gonna go over making a link aggregation with a Synology NAS and a Unify Switch, and just a few other things that I've learned along the way I'm gonna share in future videos. So keep your eyes peeled for those folks. But that's it. That's my new network as it stands, completely overhauled, brand new. I love it to pieces, and I hope you guys have enjoyed part three just as much as you've enjoyed the other two. I'll see you all in the next video. So the TV is working just fine. I've got two devices up and running. I've got the Apple TV playing a film on the screen right now. I've also fired up my Nintendo Switch. Oops, because I just wanted to show... I can't include that in. <laughs> I've got to try and be a bit professional. Whoops. <laughs>